I, here's what I want you to do. As we talk about this, just don't, don't, don't elbow your spouse, all right? Or whoever's sitting beside you. Don't, don't think about the person that this applies to that's not here. Think about you. Think about how this applies to you. Where does my arrogance or better than come from? And here's what I believe. I believe that our arrogance or our better than or our condescension and judgment, it's all rooted in what we believe is true. It's all rooted in, the, in really the truths uh, that we believe. I'm just going to give you a few. If you were raised in the church, or if you've been a Christian for a long time, you, you'll, you'll recognize this. If you are new to the faith, if you're on the fringe, I hope this is insightful for you this morning. But here's some truths that really just kind of build some things for us. One of the truths that we really do believe is we believe that we can know God. We believe that God can be known. And that he has created us and designed us in such a way to, to, to know him and to want to know him and to have a relationship with him. And we were, you know, we were given the spirit of God and to have a closeness relationship with Christ. He's our brother, you know, closer than a brother. We have the sonship and heir, you know, with a, being a child of God and he's our dad. There's this really deep closeness of the idea that from, from at least what we, what we believe that is true, that we can know God, his character, his love. We sang about it this morning. There's a few more things. We believe that, that really our lives can change in a moment. That is how powerful God is. We believe that, that in a moment, because of the gospel, because of the story we believe, because of this, this, this beautiful picture of Christ you know, dying and, and, and coming back to life and resurrection and going back to heaven and being in the place of you know, standing for us in the place beside God, we really truly believe that, that we in a moment can change when we surrender our, the controls of our life over to him, that it can instantly change. And that there are moments along the way that he just transforms us. We believe that. We believe the Bible is true and all true. That it is the final authority on absolute truth. And that everything in the Bible is true. It's not up for debate. It's this beautiful inspired word of God penned by men. Ask me how it works, I don't know but it was inspired by God and penned by men and collected and preserved, supernaturally preserved over time after time after time, centuries to come together to be this very unique set of books and instruction. Again, that helps us know God. We believe the Bible is true and that it is the final authority on everything spiritual and moral. We believe we can trust God. We believe that God can be trusted with everything in our lives. We believe that, you know, the more we trust God, the more he shows that he can be trusted. We believe that to be true. We believe that there's something very special about his church. There's something very special about the, the community and group of people that God has called the church and, 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 and the community that we get but when we gather together, that God does something different, okay? He does something special when his people gather together that he doesn't do in us personally and individually. He does something unique and special as the church, and it should be something we enjoy. It should be fun. It should be something that we live, you know, live as part of a priority in our life. And we believe that. We believe that to be true. But since the, the time he started a people, and then it became the church, that he called it his bride, and that it has massive importance. And we also believe that there are ideals that are true. That there are principles. There are principles that God gives us in our life, and because he created us, he knows how he created everything. He knows best how we function and what he's created. So he's given us ideals and principles. And if we believe those principles, we'll have a better marriage. If we live out those ideals, we'll have better relationships. If we live out those ideas, we'll have oh, better finances. I mean, we'll make better decisions if we truly understand what he says and live out the ideals that he's given us. We believe this is true. And it's, you know, just to kind of wrap it up, we, the things we believe our set of beliefs, our, our belief system, if you will. We believe that we know what God is saying to us because of his word. That if we know better what he says, then our actions come and are rooted from our belief that what we do, you know, we, Jesus said, what comes out of the heart, you know, what comes out of the, out of the mouth is, comes out of the heart. What we believe to be true, our beliefs affect everything in our life. And so our beliefs matter. 
And these are incredible, incredible truths of the faith. As I've kind of gotten a little bit older, I've noticed a few things about these truths and some of these truths is that, you know, as true as they are, it doesn't mean people are going to believe them. You know, as, as real as all this is, as powerful as all this is, it doesn't mean that people are going to hold on to it. As real and as, and as true as these truths are to us, it doesn't mean that it, it's living itself out in our lives the way God intended it to, to be the light to the world. I'll just give you a few statistics. As we were doing some research on uh, just the millennial generation, 18 to, to 30 year olds. That five years ago, 17% of them really doubted the existence of God. And that today, that number's crept up to over 35%. They just doubt the existence of God. Eight out of 10 don't feel like church is a priority at all. It's just an option. It's just an option. There's too much broken. There's too much failed in the church. So it's just an option. It's no longer something of importance. And over 65% of them today really don't want to have any religious affiliation. No denomination or religious affiliation. They don't really want to have anything to do with local religion and faith. So as true as this is, it doesn't mean that people are going to hold on to it, even if they're raised in this truth. And you know what I also found interesting is that as true as all this is, this is all true. But I have met people who believe that this is all true And they're some of the meanest people I've ever seen in my life. All right, they're judgmental. They're condescending. They are, they're, they, you know, they're racist and separatists and they're all sorts of things. They believe this is true. This is true. And they believe it's true. But it's not showing up in their life. It's not living and lived out in their life in a way that's bringing light to the world and making a difference in people's hearts and lives. So just because it's true doesn't seem to be enough. And this is all true, but it's not all that's true. And I really want to think that, that again, our arrogance, if it's, it's really rooted in what we believe is true, then I think sometimes we allow certain truths to really build walls. I think we allow truth to build walls and divide us. That's what one thing we know truth does. And I think sometimes it, it doesn't just build walls and divide us so we have this better than feeling. I think sometimes we, we, we think our system of beliefs, our building blocks of what we believe to be true, we put that to such a high level of importance that everything else fails in comparison. Why? Because it makes us feel better. Because it makes us feel better if we can stand on these system of belief, on these, on these rules, on these systems. It makes us feel better about who we are And what does it do in nature? It creates an us and a them. It creates an attitude that we're better than. And this is exactly what Jesus, when he walked in on the scene, (laughs) this is exactly what he ran into. In John chapter one, it's one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. John describes Jesus coming to earth, but not in the way Matthew does. Matthew goes chronologically and other gospels kind of jump right in on his ministry. But John takes the first chapter and he starts talking about Jesus coming in this beautiful poetic way that he's the light and he entered the darkness and, and, and you know, and nothing and his word became flesh. And, the, and as he came flesh, he came to us. And it's so beautiful. And about the middle of the, I'm not going to re- put it up on the screen, but about the middle of it in 16, he, he, he goes on to say these words. You know, we've all experienced grace upon grace out of the fullness of who God is. And Moses gave the law, but Jesus came and expressed the fullness of grace and truth. That this fullness of grace and truth that Jesus came to, be, to express in this world was something different. They already had this. He entered into a world where this already existed, but it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. It was creating in their culture, in their religion, in their systems. It was creating a set of beliefs that just made people feel better about who they were, better, better, better about how I'm doing following God than how you're doing following God, and way better than those Romans. They already had all this, and Jesus came to change it. He came to show that the fullness of truth, that really this fullness of grace and truth, could be experienced as he would live it out, as he would give out that example of what it looks like 
to humbly point those people to the absolute hope in him. And I want to show you just by example. I, I, everybody got a, uh, we told the scouts to do it. Everybody got a rubber band when you walked in? Take your rubber band out. Just kind of do this with it when you get it. This is for you to have as an illustration today, all right? I saw this done by Reggie Joyner last year. It was so good. Such a beautiful, simple principle. All right, take this and just, just toss it to the person beside you. Just throw it at them, okay? Yeah, crazy owl, right? Okay, just toss it to them. Now, you pick it back up and do this right here. Just go right against their arm. No, don't do No, I'm going to get complaints. Don't do it. <laughs> I hear snapping already. All right, <laughs> listen, here's, here's the principle. The illustration behind this is that it doesn't make this any less true. But just by itself, kind of thrown, it's just nothing, right? But when you apply tension, the truth shows up. The truth of how bad this is going to sting shows up, right? And that is what tension does. Tension in our lives really kind of puts things to the test. It really begins to stretch things. And when tension is applied, that's where the energy comes. When tension is applied, that's when influence happens. When tension is applied, that's when movements start. When tension is applied in truth, that's when the power shows up. And tension doesn't, I mean, that's just one of the things I want to make sure you know. Really, the secret to truth is this tension. The secret to understanding the fullness of truth, and I'm going to explain that in a minute, is really this, this tension, this energy that comes as we see in this rubber band. But most of us don't like tension. Why? Because tension, when it comes to truth, we feel like threatens truth, right? We feel like when our truth is tested, that it threatens it. We feel like when truth, the things we, we, you know, some of the truths that we built our life on, when it gets pressed and, and pulled and stretched, we feel like it's competing, that there's something else competing with the truth. We feel like it waters it down. And that's not what happens. Listen, tension doesn't water down truth makes it real doesn't make it less true doesn't tension doesn't take the things that are true and make them less true makes it real and that is what people are searching for people are searching for what is real and until truth is stretched until truth is tested until it's stretched and the tension comes and the energy comes and the power comes doesn't make it any less true but it makes it more real and again we don't like tension we think it competes with it but it doesn't we think it waters it down but it doesn't listen the grace of god the mercy of god does not water down the the justice of god it amplifies it right what we're called to do as believers, how we're called to live our lives, to live it out, it doesn't, it doesn't you, know, you know, compete with the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. It amplifies it. And really, if we want to make a difference in this world, if we want to get from this place where even subtly we get to or we just, we allow the things, the truths that we hold on to, to divide us. We allow it to make it an us and a them. And obviously because we're blessed and because we're favored and because we, you know, we're on God's side that there's just a little, maybe not a huge notch, but you know, and judgment comes and condescension comes and fighting comes when we allow those truths that we think separate us. When you pull, when you don't fight for the tension between truths, the lack of tension can diminish its power. It can diminish the power of truth. Remember our, 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 uh, our definition, humility. Humility is thinking of and seeing yourself as you really are. And if that's true, then you need to fight for the tension that, uh, that really comes and shows itself up in some of these truths. Let me give you an example. Let me pull this over here. We believe that we can know God. We also know that God is a mystery. Now, we believe that we can know him and we can know his character and we can know certain things about him. And we also believe there are certain things we will absolutely never know. And there's a tension there between what is true. We believe that, you know, again, we, we might not say it, but 
we think we know more than others. And there's tension and we create, we allow it to make us feel like we are better. And there's some of those that sit over here on this side and they, they just like, well, God can't be known. It's all mystical and it's all mysterious. And those who try to figure God out and you're just wasting your time, well, they're just as powerless. It is only in the tension of those truths that the power comes, the energy comes, the tension comes. When you say, yes, God can be known. He, can, he, he is going to be closer to you than a brother. He's your dad. But you know what? There's certain things my finite mind are never going to know about an infinite God. Never going to know. That's tension. That's where that lies. We believe that, that life, transformation, things can happen in a moment. We also believe that certain things are going to take forever. We believe that certain things happen in a moment. Transformation can happen in a moment. You know, salvation happens in a moment. It's like a light switch. But you know what? For others, it's a really long journey. It's a painfully long process of slowly surrendering elements of their life over to God. For some people, addictions are gone at the moment of salvation, at the moment of surrender. Addictions to alcohol and drugs, addiction to pornography, it can be gone. You can be free. And for others, they will die and still be struggling. It's a word, it's a theological word we like to use called sanctification. Now, does this make this any less true? No. God can change things in a moment. Some things will take forever. As we mature in Christ, some things will just take longer. You know, Jesus said, you know, this can happen today. You're, today, it's going to change. And other, th- other things he said, yeah, you're going to have to take up your cross daily. It's going to be a daily decision. It's going to be a daily choice. Both are true. We believe the Bible is true. We believe the Bible is fully true and truth in it. But we also believe that there's certain things about life that's, that are true. Let me just give you a little example. Romans 1 is a fantastic uh, beginning to Romans. And this is something very unique that's written in Romans. Romans 1. It says this. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, they've been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. See, what is true is that the Bible is true, and the Bible is the final authority in in terms of absolute truth, but it's not all that's true. Because God has, in his infinite divine nature, put his character and his qualities in everything that he's made. So there's truth outside of the Bible that can be learned. All right, now don't, don't put this on Facebook out of context, okay? There is, there is a difference between something that is anti-biblical against what the Bible says versus something that's just not in the Bible. There's an old quote that says, you know, the Bible wasn't given, us, given to us to tell us how the heavens go. It's given to us to tell us how to go to heaven, right? So when something in science is discovered, when something happens, you know, gravity is not in the Bible, I mean, it's there, but it's never spelled out, you know? But is it true? Marriage counseling is not in the Bible. Do we need it? Yes. There is truth in life. There is things that he has built in that we need to be good stewards of to learn and to study and to make a part of our lives because they're just as true. And there are things that the Bible specifically says and specifically talks about that is the authority of truth, but it doesn't make it any less true just because we've learned about gravity and it wasn't in the Bible. What's going to happen when your kid goes to college? And all he's ever heard is that the Bible's true and everything in the Bible is all I need to know and it's all that's true and they're going to have a conversation about something that the Bible doesn't talk about. What's going to happen then? He's given us both. And there's tension to wrestle for, for both, Obviously, we can trust him. We trust him with everything. We're also going to doubt him. We have a nature in us that drifts towards doubt and fear all the time. And so we sit in a place, we can sit in a place of trust. Well, you just need to trust God with everything. You just need to trust him with everything. And you, you're judgmental and condescending to those who are struggling to trust. But doubt is just as real. The doubt is what makes trust 
even more powerful. If, listen, if we cannot allow people to process their doubts, they will never own their own faith. I was taught in kindergarten, there was no dumb questions, right? That's what I was taught. And listen, not asking questions is dumb. If you were raised in a culture that says you're not supposed to question that, I'm sorry for that culture. Because that was a culture built on this trust thing, this idea, this faith. Well, it didn't happen because you didn't have enough faith. That's wrong. That is powerless. It is our doubts that help us own our faith. It is our doubts that move to trust when we live in the middle of that tension. And we're honest with people and we're humble with people to say, I, yeah, I, yeah, I trust, I trust him for this. I still struggle with trusting him with my money. Oh, I trust him for this. I still, str- I still struggle trusting him with my kids and their future because fear and doubt creep into my life. Both are as true as the other. You have to live in the tension of both. If you want to be humble, church is a priority. Church is, oh gosh, Church was given to us as a gift and a blessing. But we also live in the world. We also live in this world. He, he gave us this world. I'm not talking about, listen, I'm not talking about the underlying, you know, world as in the darkness of the world that's kind of at war with God. I'm not talking about that kind of world. I'm talking about your world, your family, your job, right? Where you live. Okay, he gave us a world. He created a world for us and art and culture and music and joy and relationships and, and you know, things we could discover and dig and find. He gave us all of this. He gave all of this for us to have dominion over and to have joy in. And there's importance in that, but there's just as much importance as what the church is, what he gave us the church to be. The problem is, is that people constantly want to think that these are separated. We're always separating the secular versus the sacred. You know, we get so churchy that we can't even have a conversation with real people because they have no idea what we're talking about. Don't be that. Hey, don't be so caught up in living and enjoying this world that God gave you and you forget that God gave it to you. You forget that he gave it to you for, to point back to him, to point back to his love and his grace for you. We believe there are ideals, that there are ideals, principles that we can live by. We also believe that we're broken. The problem is, is that when ideals and brokenness and the tension between the two begin to rub up in our lives, again, ideals can be something we can build a certain amount of haughtiness to. We can build a certain amount of condescension and judgment in because there's certain ideals and certain principles that you don't struggle with, but somebody else does. But you're not very honest about where your brokenness has rubbed up against those ideals. You're not very honest with people. And if you do, listen, this is what happens. I mean, we've all seen it. You know, you have a couple, a couple that's hanging out at church or in your life group, and they just look awesome, and they're like a cool Christian couple, love each other, and it's great. And all of a sudden, they don't show up to church anymore. And they're not returning emails and phone calls, and they're gone. Well, you're wondering what's going on. It's because their marriage is falling apart. And the ideals that they were clinging to that gave them some sort of hope in what God, the truth was, they ran into their brokenness and they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't think church was a place for it. They didn't think relationships with other Christians was something you could be honest about. When both are just as true. And it's tough to live in the tension of, yes, there are ideals. Yes, God hates divorce. He hates what it does to you and to your family and to kids and and the repercussions of it but he's full of forgiveness and grace and love. Both are true. Both are real. He deals with the principles and ideals in our life, and he also deals with our brokenness the same. And we are beliefs matter, guys. I mean, seriously, what we believe matters. That's what we're talking about today. But people matter. Matter of fact, Jesus came along and said people matter more. They already had beliefs. They already had, you know, their system of law. They already had everything they needed. It wasn't working. And he came and said, hey, people matter more. You guys know that, right? And listen, if your your system of beliefs ever allows you to treat another person who God loves without love, you have a messed up system of beliefs. 
It ever, if you ever feel like what you believe separates you and causes some sort of, you know, some sort of uh, I'm better than attitude, then your beliefs are skewed. Because beliefs do matter. But people matter. We just sang a song, okay? He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And I want you to know, every single person on this earth can sing that song and it be true. Not just Christians, not just ones living their life right. Everyone who's caught in lifestyles that you don't agree with, trapped in sin that you can't even fathom, that's still true words for them. He does love them more than you could possibly know. And to live in the tension that your beliefs matter, but that people matter as well. That's a tough tension in our culture. We're going to talk about in a few weeks about just sometimes we're too silent. We should be a little bit more vocal, but we can't get vocal. We can't get any more vocal than we've been until we learn how to live in the tension of all that is true in the fullness of grace and truth and live in the tension because that is where the power comes and that is where you and I begin to make a difference in this world. To live and fight for the tension of all that is true. And I'm not talking about relative truth, what's true to you versus what's true to me. I'm talking about what is true. All of this is found. All of this is found in the life of Christ. Okay, he shows up. People have the law. People matter. Who's who's he hanging out with? Tax collectors and sinners. Okay, it's funny that sinners are offended if they were grouped in with tax collectors, right? People matter. There were ideals, of course there were ideals. He, he taught those principles. He taught those ideals and he constantly extended grace and forgiveness. Well, you know, told the woman at the well, yeah, you've, you know, you've had five husbands. The one you're living with now is not even your husband. I'm gonna tell you, the, I'm gonna tell you something about me that no one else knows. I'm the Messiah. Go spread the word and go, so, go sin no more. Ideals matter but he knows the broken church. Church didn't even exist till after Christ, but the gathering of God's people, it was important to him. He said, don't forsake that. Don't forsake the gathering together. He wanted people to know that it was important to do that, but he also lived in a world. He was a carpenter. He got splinters. Okay. He lived in this world. He knew, he knew that he needed to be as in the world, not of the world as he could be to make a difference in this world, all the while upholding the gathering of God's people, the collection and community that breathes and fuels us. Trust and doubt. And Jesus never, we never talk about Jesus doubting things. He trusted God with all things because he was God. But there were plenty of times that he got away privately and talked with God. That he was always rubbing up against his humanity. He was always rubbing up against the place where doubt would exist for most of us. In the garden of Gethsemane as he prays, Father, let this cup pass from me. And yet he still owned it. He still trusted. He quoted the Old Testament because there's truth. He told stories about seeds and trees and farmers and sheep because it was true. He lived in both. He knew that Again, in a moment, he could change everything. On the cross, he tells the, 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 the sinner next to him, today you're going to be with me. In this, mom- in this moment, you're going to be there. He tells the disciples, it's going to be a hard, long road. You're going to have to take up your cross daily. Make a choice daily to follow me. How many times did he say, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. If you've seen, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen God. You can know God. You can know God personally. That's why I'm here. No man knows the the day or the hour when I'm going to return. No one's going to fully know. His ways are higher than our ways. Even Jesus lived and exampled for everyone. And here's the deal, right? Jesus never seemed to have a problem in humility living out who he actually was. 
because he was always living in the truth and the tension of the truth. And where he lived was where the power was, where the energy was. It's where everything was stretched. It's where everything was not simple. And some truth, when you only live in some truths, they lose clarity over time. Again, there's people who live over here. Listen, there's people who live over here. I get it. You, you feel better about who you are when you live over here. There's people who live over here. You know, the hippie, gypsy, love wins crowd, right? There's people who live over here. Oh, all the things they say are true, but they've divorced them from other truths that matter. Both are powerless. Both over time lose clarity. Both over time are not going to make a difference in this world. Right here. This is where humility is found. Humility is found in living in the tension of the fullness of what is true. In the fullness, as Jesus did, of grace and truth. 